Well, I see we are one minute away, so that is going to give me time uh, to just tell everybody. Welcome. Um, we have a chat room there. You can see the chat room there. What you should do in the chat room after you say hello. Uh, oh, look, we got someone else from South Africa. Hello, KG from South Africa. Uh, we got Luciana from Brazil, Diana from Portugal, and uh, I saw Jacqueline, Jacqueline from Texas. Hello, Jacqueline, I know her. <laughs> okay, uh, what I want you to do, if you uh, have a question during the presentation, I want you to just put that in the chat room, and then afterwards, we're gonna have a question and answer session where uh, uh, our experts will answer those questions. Uh, I also want to point out that we have shared a number of files with you. Uh, and these are related to the IFSCC. So those are for download, you can, you can get those. Uh, we don't yet have the presentation slides up for download, but we will have that later uh, for something to download. Uh, okay, and without further ado, I'm going to first uh, uh, introduce, well, let me uh, explain who we've got uh, talking today. Today, we're joined by Neil Cunningham. He's the founder and CEO of the Center for Industrial Rheology. Since uh, starting in the field in 1995, he has successfully carved a niche consulting uh, for the world's leading manufacturers of cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, foods, and many other products. Neil has trained and advised thousands of scientific personnel in the principles and practical application of rheology and viscosity testing, and has gained a reputation for his accessible, enthusiastic approach to rheology. <laughs> uh, actually, that's why we invited him on here, because I saw this presentation, I thought, hey, these guys are relatable. Uh, so, uh, and his ability to convey seemingly impenetrable concepts to even the most non-technical uh, persons. Welcome, Neil. Uh, also, with Thanks, Neil is, also with Neil is Joey Hodges. He started working for the Center for Industrial Rheology in 2017 as technical sales rep for the cosmetics and food sectors. His responsibilities now also include overseeing the center's marketing efforts, uh, including the creation of the YouTube videos. Again, a nice YouTube channel that they have. Uh, he has editorial review of the website, articles, management of social media, and generally helping to educate the wider scientific community about simple practical uses of rheology and industry. We're looking forward to their talk, but before we get to those two guys, uh, let me introduce uh, Mary Lynn Hallett, the uh, Secretariat for the IFSCC, and she is gonna give a short presentation on the IFSCC and what we've got coming. So you get to take it away there, Mary Lynn. Thank you so much, Perry. Let's see if I can do this in under three minutes. That's my best time so far. So what is the IFSCC? It stands for International Federation of Societies of Cosmetic Chemists. We're a worldwide federation with 49 national societies, and hopefully one more will be joining us this fall. We are dedicated to the international cooperation in cosmetic science and technology. And if you need to figure out, uh, if you're not a member of one of our um, member societies and you want to join, go to ifscc.org and find your national society. It seems like I've gone to just audio only. I apologize. I'm out at my sister's house. I'm not in, I'm working remotely this week. So maybe the connection is bad. Um, just a brief overview of our individual member benefits. You get an IFSCC magazine four times a year digitally, and it, you also have the opportunity to submit papers to our magazine. You get free access to Cosmet.com, which is our database of almost 100,000 cosmetic science articles, papers, podiums, presentations, etc. We've been building Cosmet for over 20 years, and it's an, an invaluable resource for those of you in this field. It's the only place you can get our IFSCC magazine archive and presentations and podiums and posters from our conferences and congresses starting in 1995. It's the only place we have them. We also have a virtual library at ifscc.org, and that will be where today's webinar will be posted once we've uh, done a little bit of editing. You can also access reference books, textbooks, and articles there. Um, you can, we do have the um, archive of our magazine there as well. 
and let's see, posters and podiums, some of them. Um, you have the opportunity to win prestigious awards at our annual Congress and Conference. And we have special awards for young scientists. Perry, on our, um, on our, during this webinar, people can actually access the flyers that yeah, give we've, uh, if, you, if you see above the chat uh, box, there are files or below the chat box, uh, there are files that you can download uh, to check out. So there's a flyer there with the details on the Young Scientist Award and flyers in uh, English and Spanish um, with all the details of membership benefits. We also fly experts around the world to do on-site educational programs. Now that's been put on hold due to COVID obviously, but we did launch this webinar series instead. And as a member, you get discounted registration to our annual Congress or conference. So that's us, we're One World of Beauty, the IFSCC. And Perry, can you help me bring up the, or maybe I can do it myself, the Yokohama, here we go. Just wanted to mention that the IFSCC conference this year was scheduled for Yokohama, Japan. It will still be, well, kind of in Yokohama, but it's gone virtual. So um, for less than $200 or less than 200 euros, you can now attend an IFSCC conference, Congress. Um, the in-person rate to register was 1,500. So it's a huge, um, savings obviously and everything can be accessed online for 10 days all the podiums and all the posters all right well that's not coming up so i'm just going to stop that and i'm going to turn it back to perry okay why don't we just uh get this thing working before it breaks again okay. <laughs> if you have a question feel free to put it in the chat uh and so why don't you guys uh take it away Fantastic. Thanks, Perry. Right. We'll start right. with the sharing the screen there. Oh, here we go. And okie doke. Um, so is it showing, it should be hopefully just my desktop background. Um, uh, it's showing your desktop and it's got you two, your two cameras are on. If you want to ever turn your camera off, you can do that and turn it back on. Um, okay. So, all right. Why don't you guys take it away? Fantastic. Great. Well, um, firstly, um, from both Neil and myself, just wanted to say a massive thank you uh, to Mary Lynn and Perry for inviting us to deliver this. Um, Neil and I have been working with, uh, you know, some really big names within the cosmetics industry uh, for a number of years now. Guys like Estee Lauder, Ashland, uh, Jividan, Croda, uh, Coty. And we don't just get involved in rheology. You know, rheology is kind of the bread and butter of what we do, but we get involved in a whole bunch of other uh, kind of physical characterization work. So tribology, um, the kind of cool brother of rheology where we're looking at friction lubrication, uh, powder flow characteristics and interfacial rheology. Um, if you ever wanna have a chat um, or kind of want to revisit this webinar uh, in kind of a one-on-one -on -one session, you're more than welcome to contact either Neil or myself, uh, joey at rheologylab.com or neil at rheologylab.com. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll focus in on uh, the uh, kind of practical applications of rheology for cosmetics. So if you're watching this, you probably spend a lot of your time with wrestling with a number of issues such as uh, the ones shown screen now. Um, so Neil, what would you say are uh, kind of the most popular topics that we get asked about or um, what in your experience has been a uh, hot area? Yeah, thanks, Joey. Yeah. So so typically here, um, we may have a uh, customer who's interested in, let's say, for example, they want to replace silicone. They want to remove silicone from a formulation and replace that. Um, so they've got to identify a product that's going to have the same sensory characteristics, maybe a polymer that they include in their formulation will have the same sensory characteristics. There may be some impact on stability in there. Um, uh, they may also be looking maybe to generate uh, some data that you can use to support some claims with a new formulation there. So that's a very typical kind of situation that we would get involved with. Uh, equally, we may have a, um, a contract manufacturer, uh, uh, private label manufacturer. They've, their customers identified a, um, a benchmark in the marketplace, and, uh, and they've asked them to, you know, can, what's the closest you can get to this? Can you reverse engineer? Can you hack this, the rheology of this product, really? 
and uh, and that's very typical of the kind of thing we do there and and, uh, and then looking at taking that product from the laboratory uh, into a pilot scale and then up into a process scale so when it comes to with uh, when it comes to rheology uh, a lot of cosmetic scientists when they're first starting out um, and it, as kind of uh, Perry highlighted uh, they use a rotational viscometer like a Brookfield um, to uh, get a quick measurement of viscosity um, but this doesn't completely capture um, all of the uh, rheological nuance that you can get with your product. Um, and sometimes a rheometer might be uh, a kind of a more appropriate approach uh, for understanding more complex behaviors. Yeah, and, and certainly there, um, if you start looking at something like a, you know, a, a spindle number three at 20 RPM on an RV viscometer, uh, that, that viscosity value there, it's uh, using that to describe a complex product like a, like a moisturizing cream or a foundation or something like that. That's, yeah, it's a bit like describing an elephant as something gray with, with, and, and ignoring the fact that it's a huge animal, it's got four legs, it's got two tusks <laughs> and a trunk, really. So, um, uh, and that's what rheology fills in the rest of that information, a, a lot of that information. Then you've got tribology and interfacial and those kind of things uh, are the icing on the cake there as well. So that's a, it's quite a useful thought exercise. Um, with viscosity, there's other things like yield stress, which we'll get into. But before we even dive into rheology, um, if we just take a, a quick step back and kick off with a quick exercise in how to think like a rheologist. So whenever uh, Neil and I are performing these uh, training sessions, um, we're usually in Walmart the night before collecting a whole bunch of uh, kind of household items that exemplify core ideas in rheology. Uh, you know, we've got things like mayonnaise or honey uh, or different creams. And we deliver these to a, a large number of groups with great effect. Um, and more recently, we've been delivering more and more of these training sessions online. Typically, what we'll do is we'll ask uh, our customers to uh, split these products that you see on screen. So uh, hand soap, mayonnaise, lip balms, uh, jellies into two categories, solids and liquids. And it's actually uh, quite a challenging thing to do. Most of the time, our participants will end up with something like this. Um, but there's uh, some of the more astute among you may have noticed there are a few key products that are missing in here, uh, such as a mayonnaise. Yeah, certainly. And uh, and what often happens is you get something that, you know, that we start looking at the definition. How do you define a liquid? How do you identify a liquid? And, uh, and there we're typically looking at the, the usual uh, response there is, well, it fills the shape of the container and, uh, and it flows out to, to adopt that shape. And a solid, on the other hand, just stands on its own. Uh, we like to think of it as a solid exhibiting bounce back ability, what you call an elastic response, really. Um, we often think in terms of sandwiches, really, and you think about a jello sandwich compared to a honey sandwich. A jello sandwich, you could give it a shove and go and it bounce back into its original shape. Uh, a honey sandwich, uh, we, we give that a shift and then we're going to get a permanent deformation. A permanent deformation is essentially its flow, really. That's another word for flow. Um, and then what often happens is we do this solids to liquids uh, exercise here, really. We find out that there's a whole bunch of things that don't fit comfortably into these ranges. So we, we're kind of looking for some other sort of cluster in there, some other categorization. And we end up throwing a whole bunch of stuff into the semi-solids um, semi -solids group here. But even then, that's, that's still not quite right, really, because we can see a lot of elastic behaviors in the hand soap and some, uh, some uh, flow behaviors in the cream and the mayonnaise and things like that. So another approach we often take then is to, you know, put these things into a line. We've got most solid at one end and most liquid at the other. And uh, yeah, and Jerry, that, that creates uh, equal issues there, really, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it starts getting more challenging when you've got these products um, that seem to change where they want to sit within this line. In fact, we've got this uh, really interesting video um, where we have, uh, hopefully it's playing, okay. So we've got a, a honey on the right hand side, which is a, a high viscosity product. And we've got, I think it's a mango juice or some kind of fruit smoothie on the left. Um, and watch, out, watch what happens when we stick a spoon in here. Now, it's no surprise when you stick the spoon into the honey, you give it enough time or you give it a gentle prod that it falls over. But on the left hand side, the fruit smoothie is actually supporting the spoon. And in fact, when we're giving it a prod, that spoon's actually bouncing back. Uh, the honey is unable to support uh, the weight of that spoon. Um, and these are just off the shelf products that you can use to see rheology in action. There's certainly something a bit more interesting than just viscosity going on here. 
Um, yeah, and what you can see here, actually, uh, this is a great example that uh, Jerry's thrown up on the screen now. What we've now got is we've got two products that are exhibiting both solid light behaviors under some conditions, liquid light behaviors under others. But the conditions, are, there's a subtle difference between those conditions. On the left hand side here, we can see that the mayonnaise has got this soft solid structure. When we give it a push, uh, we can get it to flow. On the right hand side, you can see the hand soap here. And uh, there it's kind of it's more naturally like a liquid, uh, but we can get it to exhibit to, to you know, smoke out a little bit of soft um, elastic behavior in that really. So um, on the left, it's all about how hard we're pushing it. On the right, it's all about if, if we're taking our time and letting it flow or if we're giving it a little bit of a nudge and keeping that time scale short, really. And uh, and that leads into a really important practical classification uh, for these products. So when we're delivering these training courses, we encourage, and this is a, a classification that we've come up with ourselves, um, but we, we like to break up this uh, category of semi-solids into two areas, uh, structured liquids, um, that is solids that can be made to flow. So these are typically uh, things like uh, your emulsions and gels. And then we've got elastic liquids. So these are liquids that can be made to bounce. Um, so, uh, what, uh, the kind of hallmark of a structured liquid is that it has this soft solid structure under really low stresses. Um, but if you apply enough force, enough stress, and you exceed the yield stress of the material, you can initiate a permanent deformation, also known as flow. In the case of an elastic liquid, um, you'll uh, get dominant liquid-like behavior, but over short time scale, uh, short time scale deformations, um, such as gently tapping that spoon on top of the soap, you can get it to bounce. And these are typically uh, uh, kind of surfactant solutions or um, kind of high uh, molecular weight polymers that are uh, uh, generally within this category. And they tend to have this stringy lubricious uh, appearance. Yeah, and that stringiness and that lubric lubri lubricity uh, is actually really important as well in terms of the contribution. So particularly the stringiness from a processing point of view is problematic, uh, but the lubri lubricity uh, from a sensory point of view is absolutely critical, really. So what we've got, when we've got, we've now got these classifications, structured liquids and elastic liquids, we have to think about then, uh, well, what do we need to measure? What do we need? What information do we need to accurately describe and fully com comprehensively describe these particular products really. And so we've got a whole bunch of things. If we look at structured liquids, well, we've got viscosity and, uh, and there we're really interested in viscosity across a range of different shear conditions. But because these structured liquids have this soft solid structure when they're at rest, then we need to measure that structure. We need to measure two things. We need to measure the rigidity of the structure and we need to measure the strength of that structure. Whether it's stiff like cheese or soft and wobbly like jello, and also if you have to push hard to get it to flow or you have to, or it will just pour easily out of a container. Um, and then whenever you've got structure, you've also got fixotropy. You've got this time dependent change where things will take time to break down and time to recover again. So we need to capture that. For the elastic liquids, we're interested in things like, uh, well, the viscosity again, um, but we're also interested in where the product sits on that viscoelastic spectrum. It's, it, is it more like jello that flows a bit or is it more like honey that bounces a bit, really? And so we can quantify that with some viscoelastic metrics there. And then we're also interested in the extensional behavior and because uh, uh, that can contribute to the lubrication and the stringiness, really. Okay, so there's clearly uh, a lot more to these materials than uh, just looking at the viscosity. And if you want to get serious about measuring rheology, um, you need to start thinking about, um, well, what kit could I potentially be use, uh, using to look at this? And um, there's this uh, quote by a famous uh, philosopher, Abraham Maslow, which we're really fond of here. And that's, if all you have is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. And when all you have is something like a viscometer, you tend to think of the physical properties of your products uh, in terms of viscosity alone. What we need is an instrument that can replicate what we do when we interact with a product. And these will typically be things like uh, rheometers. And the great benefit about using a rheometer um, is that it can mimic a whole bunch of really diverse and complex situations. The action of mixing uh, a formulation within a beaker is totally different to what occurs during processing. You know, the, the shear rates are fundamentally different. 
Um, the stresses acting upon a product while it's in storage are again totally different to the applied stress uh, that, it, that onto the product whilst you're spreading it onto the skin, and even more so if you're trying to spray the product. Yeah, and, and this is a really important point actually that that what we've got here then when when we interact with a product, particularly when you're handling a product, uh, you're you're spreading and applying whatever. Um, there's a huge range of different stresses that we're applying with that really. Um, the key point here really is rheology is it's essential activity really. It's all about tact tactility and all about touching and feeling materials really. And so we want to get our rheometers to do exactly the same thing and that's what they're really good at and they can do it in a much more repeatable, representative and um, uh, reproducible way really. So. Um, uh, so we're really talking about the science of touching and feeling products and the, we need to get into the math of, of touching and feeling these products. And whenever you're handling a product, you're going to give something a push. You're going to apply a certain force to it. If that's a solid, let's say it's a chunk of jello or something, it's going to deform and uh, we'll get a certain deformation in there. If, on the other hand, when we apply a stress to a liquid, I apply some force to a liquid, it's going to flow. And so what we now need to do then really is we need to quantify uh, the metrics around this, um, uh, and that's really uh, the um, uh, the basic units that our rheometer uh, will use for our, for understanding these products. So if we start off with um, how hard we push a material, the way we quantify that is the shear stress. Okay, so it's the force that we're applying across the area that we're applying that force over. We apply a shear stress to a solid, we're going to get a deformation, and we quantify the deformation with strain the shear strain. And that's basically the amount of displacement di divided by the amount of product that there is to displace. And uh, if on the other hand, our product that we're, we're applying the stress to is a liquid, then that deformation is just gonna carry on. We're gonna keep on getting an increasing deformation. In other words, it's flowing. And, uh, and we quantify that with shear rate. So shear rate then is just the velocity gradient. It's the velocity uh, difference between the upper and lower surface divided by the height of that shear field there, really. And then when it comes to um, to the rheometers then, and the business end of the rheometer really, where it actually meets the sample, there's a bunch of different ways in which the rheometer can apply these stresses and, and uh, measure the deformations and measure the shear rates here. And uh, you've got three typical measuring systems on the screen here at the moment really. Um, a cone plate system, parallel plate system, and concentric cylinders. And the good thing about all of these is you're working with a really small sample, so you're not having to use a great big beaker of products, uh, you've got the sample held between two surfaces that are that are close to each other. So you have a lot of control in that. And because you have a very small sample, temperature control is really good as well. You can get, get a sample to temperature um, in no time. So we've already identified there that we've got these we've got this bunch of materials that exhibit these solid like characteristics under some conditions liquid-like characteristics under others. So what then what we need to do is we need to work out, okay, what are we gonna quantify? So quantify the solid-like behavior. The first thing to go for is to measure the rigidity, and we call this the modulus, okay? And the modulus then is just the ratio of how hard you push to how much deformation you get for the material. Uh, if it's a soft product, you give it a push, you're gonna get a big deformation. If it's a stiff product, you give it a push, you'll get a small deformation there. And you can see a bunch of um, products showing typical modulus values there. If on the other hand, we're talking about a liquid, then uh, when we apply a stress to a liquid, it's gonna flow. So the way we quantify a liquid is the viscosity. And then so the viscosity of a liquid then is just the ratio of how hard you push to how fast it flows. And um, uh, and again, same thing there, really. We can see a, a, a list of materials there showing some typical viscosities. Just a word about units here. We're using uh, the unit of Pascal second or millipascal seconds here in the list at the bottom of that slide there. Millipascal seconds and centipoise are the same thing, really. So uh, if you're more used to using centipoise on your viscometer, that's just a straightforward translation there. Okay, so um, we've talked a lot um, about uh, the viscosity of certain products and a lot of spec sheets for liquid products will uh, refer to viscosity as a single number. And this is working on the assumption that the product is a uh, Newtonian behavior. That is, uh, the viscosity does not change depending on the shear that you're uh, applying to it. But, actual, uh, but actually most gels, suspensions and emulsions um, display non-Newtonian behavior. And we've got a short video which emphasizes 
uh, significance of this. Uh, what we have is a mayonnaise on the right-hand side, and you can see it's holding its shape in part due to its high viscosity. And we've got a syrup on the left-hand side. Now watch what happens when we go to shear these two products with a spoon. Um, the, uh, on the left-hand side, even though uh, the syrup may, uh, ha may have had a lower viscosity, it's actually dragged the plate forward. Um, whereas the mayonnaise on the other hand, that viscosity has dropped right down and it's an, uh, allowed the material to be sheared and left, uh, left the plate in its original position. Okay. Fantastic. And what you can see here then is uh, uh, this is a very typical viscosity profile performed on these products. So we've taken the product, we've measured across a range, a range of shear rates there, and uh, we can see that the syrup there has got a straight line. This is Newtonian behavior. So Newtonian behavior basically means that the viscosity is independent of the shear rate. It means that the viscosity is just a single number at a certain temperature. If you change the temperature, it will change. But, um, but what we can see for the mayonnaise there is that it's non-Newtonian and specifically it's shear thinning. So that basically means that at low shear rates, the viscosity is high. And, and importantly here, it's higher than the syrup. And that's why it stands up, whereas the syrup flows out flat. But then when you apply some shear to it, it shears down hugely uh, down to a much lower viscosity. And that's why under shear, the mayonnaise did not have the pull to drag that plate across the table. So viscosity profiling uh, or looking at viscosity as a function of shear rate is a typical next step up from a single point viscometry. So remember that your product might be deformed any number of ways. And if it's non-Newtonian, it's behavior. That resistance will be changing based on how you interact with it. But viscosity is, doesn't, um, you know, we've got a bunch of shear thinning products here. Uh, viscosity doesn't drop to zero uh, at infinitely high shear rates or go up to infinity at low shear rates. Instead, what we see are these plateau values. Yeah, and, and so what we can see here, this is really important because once you start to get beyond uh, the simple viscosity measurements, you start to get into these extended shear rate sweeps, then we start to see some really interesting behavior. So we can see, see a shear thinning region in the middle there, just like we saw for the mayonnaise, but then at low shear and a high shear respectively, we've got what we call the zero shear viscosity and the infinite shear viscosity. And this really rare rheology really starts to come into its own because um, the zero shear viscosity in, protect, in particular is really interesting to us because that zero shear viscosity is the closest thing we can get to measuring the viscosity of our product when it's in an at rest condition. Now, if you bear in mind that your product, let's say your product has a shelf life for two years, it may be in a state of motion for little more than two minutes over that two years, really. You know, so the product's been handled, squirted, spread, sprayed, that sort of thing, really. The rest of the time, it's sat at that zero shear viscosity. So if you're taking a measurement that's way outside of that zero shear viscosity range, then it's not giving you the information you need, really. So if we can capture that zero shear viscosity, that's going to give us a lot of information on how well that formulation can immobilize suspended particles and immobilize and slow down the interaction and the, the creaming of um, emulsified droplets there. So, uh, so if you're getting into stability, then zero shear viscosity is a fantastic place to get started here. And we've actually got a, a, a couple of real examples here now. So what you can see here is a pseudocreme formulation. And, um, and the typical measurements that you obtain from a viscometer uh, are way up at the sort of the upper end um, or the mid to upper end of the shear rate range. I think you should be able to see that on the plot in a second. Um, but what we want to do, if we, if we start looking as we go down further down into shear, uh, you can see a couple of measurements further down. Uh, Jerry, I don't think we can see that. That's it, got it, okay. So down there at that lower data point there then, um, if we allowed our rheometer to, take, to do a whole rotation, it's gonna take a whole week to do that rotation. The rheometers have got these fantastic um, uh, performance and, uh, and they can actually gather that data in just a few, uh, just a, uh, 30 seconds or a minute, something like that really. And we go right down at the bottom end, you were talking about three months uh, for a whole rotation. OK, so that's pretty good for a, you know, a simple half an hour or an hour long uh, test on a rheometer, really. And, um, and then if you're looking at stability, you're looking to impart these big zero shear viscosities into your product. Then you've got a great example. 
here we've got, you know, Beinsdorf have done a fantastic job with Nivea here. What they've done is they've given us a viscosity, a zero shear viscosity for a product that's a thousand times thicker than honey when it's at rest, really. But you can pour this stuff out of the bottle. It'll shear down nice and easy and you can get it out of the bottle nice and easily, really. I think moving on, we can show some other examples of some day creams here. Uh, so we're looking at viscosity versus stress here. The Garnier cream here is uh, showing a drop of half a million fold viscosity above and below the yield point. The yield point is that precipitous drop that you're seeing there. And we can see a whole range of zero shear viscosities for these. This is you know, really nice data. I really like this data. And, uh, and also, if you're thickening a surfactant solution with salt, then the simple addition of a little bit, little bit of salt can actually ramp up, as we've shown here, um, ramp up the zero shear viscosity by 35 times, which is a, you know, a very small increase in the salt content here. So Neil and I spend a, a disproportionate amount of time checking out our food when in a restaurant looking for uh, some great <laughs> examples of rheology. And um, uh, this is actually an example of a miso soup. Um, so we've just given it a stir so you can see that it's been mixed up. It's mostly, well, it starts off unstructured and homogenous. But over time, the particles start to interact with each other. They start uh, kind of uh, getting in close, um, kind of like the animation that you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. They start to flocculate, creating these structures reminiscent of tectonic plates or subduction zones. You know, this is basically um, similar to what's going on with the surface of the Earth. With the addition of structure into a formulation, you're uh, you're starting to uh, bring in um, uh, well challenges in around thixotropy. Yeah, and certainly thixotropy is once you've got structure involved, then thixotropy uh, kind of rears its head really. And thixotropy is where viscosity changes with time, uh, changes with the time of shearing. So if you're using a viscometer, you've probably all seen this situation where you take a measurement. And then over a period of time, your viscosity value uh, drops and drops and drops steadily there. And eventually it will stabilize out, really. But sometimes it can seem to take interminably long time to do that, really. And this is an indication of fixotropic behavior. And we've got a couple of examples. A, a fixotropic product is basically a product that is slow in shearing down and then equally slow in recovering after shear. You look at these two videos here. We've got a um, this is a bentonite ge gel in the top video. And that's fantastic. It's instant grab there. Uh, alternatively, we've got a product that shows a, a really long, prolonged thixotropic recovery. This is the mustard here, really. Uh, you give that a shake and it stays creamy for a long period of time. So when, once we're um, starting to get into uh, thixotropy and structure, then we have to look at some other tools and some other techniques for taking the measurements. Yeah, so if you could imagine something like a panna cotta, you know, when it's cooked, uh, you don't go to check to see whether it's ready by jamming your spoon in there and giving it a stir, um, which would completely destroy the very structure that you're trying to create. But this is, in effect, similar to what a Brookfield viscometer is doing. You know, um, a viscosity measurement is actually a pretty brutal experience for the sample. Um, in the context of panna cotta, what you do instead is you very give it you give it a very gentle nudge with your spoon, and then you let it uh, bounce back, and you keep pushing harder and harder and harder uh, until you start to see the sample break. And this is exactly the kind of situation that we can recreate with our rheometers. In this little video underneath, what we've got is an HA gel sample, and you can see the geometry on top is just wobbling it back and forth, and this is to uh, pick up. Uh, the uh, well uh, to measure the uh, complex modulus of the uh, material. Yeah, so basically what's happening here then is we're applying a sinusoidal stress wave to the sample and uh, and we're measuring the resulting deformation. If you've got something like a jello or a, you know, a solid material there, then that deformation will be in phase with the applied stress. Uh, alternatively, if we let's say, for example, we, we've got an unstructured material like a liquid like honey, or maybe we had a structured material, but we've broken the structure by applying sufficient stress to it, then uh, we, the, the strain is going to be out of phase with the applied stress. So we get a bunch of information from this technique. We get a measure of the rigidity of the sample. We get a measure of the phase angle and measure the presence of this structure. And we can tie this together. And then what you also get from this is you can extract some uh, two other viscoelastic moduli that you'll often see around what we call the storage modulus and the loss modulus. 
So when I was first learning about uh, moduli, so complex modulus, storage modulus, and loss modulus, it was really difficult to get my head around it. Um, but I found this, uh, this kind of explanation really useful um, for uh, getting a rough idea of what, what it actually relates back to. If you imagine squeezing a wet sponge, you can think of the resistance that you're encountering as the uh, overall rigidity, the complex modulus. That resistance to being squeezed is going to come from a combination of the rigidity of the sponge, so uh, you can think of the storage modulus, and the contribution of the viscosity of water. Yeah, and this is a yeah, it's a pretty it's it's an unscientific but it's a nice intuitive way of thinking about this really, and this uh, it's not just an addition there, a straightforward addition of storage modulus and loss mm. modulus. It's a vector addition in there really, but then you th start thinking about okay then so yeah if you've got a more rigid sponge like the pudding we can see down on the bottom right, or we've got a higher viscosity liquid in there, so we've got some syrup in there, then they're both going to lead to a higher overall modulus for the for the product. Okay, so let's get this back to some real products that we'd like to be working with. So uh, oscillation stress suite tests are a fantastic way of uh, gently nudging a whole bunch of different cosmetic products and, and getting a feel for the uh, the pickup and the, the rigidity and the bounciness of, of structures, really. So uh, here we can see a whole range of products. We, uh, we've got complex modulus on the y-axis, oscillation stress on the x-axis, and we're gently nudging these products harder and harder throughout the test, and we see them ultimately yield at the end of the test. If the modulus value is high, that plateau is high, then you can, it's, it's gonna be stiff, it's gonna be like hard cheese or something like that. If it's low, it means you're gonna have a soft, bouncy texture. Another way of looking at this is to look at the phase angle then. So remember the phase angle then, if it's in phase, we have a phase angle of zero degrees. That's an indication that we've got a soft, solid structure that's present. If we're out of phase, then the phase angle will go up towards 90 degrees. So we can use phase angle against stress as a way of identifying the yield points of materials. And this is we use this test probably more than anything else here in the lab, actually, for, mm. for a lot of our testing, really. And if we go on to the, um, onto the next slide there, we can see uh, the same samples that we talked about earlier, but um, looking at the phase angle versus stress there, and now we can clearly see the yield points where the phase angle heads upwards towards 90 degrees. And we can see the high yield stress for the Clarins uh, cream in there. Uh, that's right over on the uh, on the right hand side. And then the, the other product, the products down on the left, uh, these are much more delicate. They tend to be lotions. They're pourable. That's what you're looking for, really, in a, in a lotion. Low yield stress, so easy pouring, um, delicate texture, uh, that kind of thing. Then we could take the modulus values and the yield stress values, and ultimately we could create texture maps there. So uh, remember, there's no viscosity in this yet at all, really. So what we're doing here is we're looking at this soft, solid structure here, really. So on here, we've got a whole bunch of day creams, and we're comparing the modulus on the uh, vertical axis against the yield stress. And then you can see that all these different products in the marketplace actually occupy their own particularly unique places there. Uh, and this is a fantastic tool if you want to reverse engineer a product, you want to identify the impacts of a change in the formulation, aging, uh, different process, all that sort of thing, really. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. No problem. No problem. Uh, right. Okay. So what we can then do with oscillation, we don't always just have to change the stress. What we can do is we can maintain the same stress, so we could just change the frequency. When we start to get into elastic liquids, there's two ways that we want to understand those. We want to understand the viscoelastic properties of those. And uh, you can see a classic elastic liquid in the video there. So it flows like honey, but it wobbles like jello. Classic elastic liquid behavior there. And we can see that, and that's, that's gonna give us something like that viscoelastic hand soap that you can see down on the bottom left there, where across a range of frequencies, at low frequencies, the loss modulus is higher than the storage modulus. And then at higher frequencies, we get a cross over there. And that's that transition. At low frequencies, is more like honey than jello. At high frequencies, is more like jello than honey. It's a great way of uh, fingerprinting um, uh, properties in a, in a product like this. OK, so um, we're uh, looking at viscoelastic properties. And um, if you take a look at this product in the top left-hand corner, this snotty, slimy, stringy product, um, it's capable of extending without breaking in the z-axis. Um, if you, instead of trying to pull your hands apart, uh, try to bring your hands together and you compress the material, what you actually end up doing is creating an extension in the x-y plane. 
This is kind of a little bit like squidging a marshmallow. You can imagine uh, that if you're trying to bring your fingers together, that marshmallow uh, will resist. Uh, well, it will provide this cushioning effect, preventing your two fingers from uh, coming into contact. Um, but you can actually uh, squidge the marshmallow from side to side. Um, this extensional property prevents those two, your fingertips, from coming into contact and actually provides cushioning and uh, quite good lubrication as well. This is a really important behavior, really, because this ability to maintain separation of surfaces, that then uh, modulates how much you can feel between when you're applying a product onto your skin. So if some, you take it to the extreme, something's really slimy, then a big part of that slimy sensation and texture there is the loss of the ability to feel the texture of your skin there, really. So, um, uh, so getting that just right, optimizing that is, is really important, particularly if you are looking at replacing silicone with a polymer or something like that, which could have a tendency to do this, really. So, um, uh, and this is a this is this sort of cushioning behavior. Uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, causes problems when you crack eggs into a bowl and you get the eggshell in the bowl there. You, know, you get your finger in there and you're trying to chase a bit of eggshell around there and you've got this cushion, this viscoelastic cushion of material that's stopping you from, from uh, getting your finger in touch with that better shell there, really. So this is really important. It's a really important lubrication mechanism. So, and this ultimately leads into tribological behavior. But one of the things we could do here is look at some of the viscoelastic behaviors then uh, that, that, uh, that lead to this and predict these kind of behaviors. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, Joey, over to you. Sorry. Yeah, it's all good. I'm a little conscious of time, but we really, really wanted to cram in some other cool stuff um, that we wanted to show you. So um, one of the first things um, was uh, to be conscious of slip when working with uh, kind of viscometers and rheometers, actually. Um, what we can see in this video here, we've got uh, roughened glass on the left and polished glass on the right. And although nice, smooth, shiny surfaces look incredible as a geometry, um, and they look kind of quite visually impressive, they're a nightmare for being used with rheology um, because you end up just sliding the sample on top of uh, the, uh, well, on top of your measuring system, and you're not actually measuring the shear, you're measuring the coefficient of friction. So what we use with our rheometers, uh, we have these cross-hatched plates or sandblasted plates that really quite uh, tightly uh, or really bite into the sample, um, kind of eliminating that slip. And you can see the difference that it makes uh, with the viscosity shear rate profile here. Yeah, there's really, there's loads of opportunity here to misinterpret slip as other behaviors. And I've seen that mm. many a time when we're running training courses and the customer gets the data out and, and shows us what's going on. And you can see these slip behaviors, you know, really, really obviously. So, um, and you look at that, the smooth surface there, you could easily misinterpret that it's got a, a second zero shear plateau, or what's going on there, or another yield, or something like that that's going on. So, um, yeah, knowing how to grip your sample and handle your sample is a big part of, uh, of uh, practical rheology. Okay, well, I think we want to talk about a few of the new cool techniques, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, slip isn't uh, always all that bad. Sometimes it can be a really interesting thing to study. I mean, certainly, um, tribology is all about the study of friction and lubrication. If you imagine the whole uh, process of taking a cream and spreading it onto your skin, um, you can break it down into a stage process. The initial uh, appearance of the product um, is uh, going to be determined by its rheology, you know, the fact that it holds its shape, and even a little bit when you start to apply it onto your skin before, uh, when, uh, when you've got a great distance between your fingertip and uh, let's say the back of your hand. Um, when you're shearing the sample, rheology, again, is still determining most of the sensory characteristics that are being sensed there. But when you start to get into a really thin film, you start to bring your fingertips into contact with your skin. You enter into a, diff uh, a different mechanical process, uh, this kind of sliding your fingertips across the back of your hand. And the uh, the cosmetic product is now instead acting as a lubricant in the situation. And this is exactly what we do with our rheometers. Uh, we use a three ball and plate system. So we have uh, a, uh, these hemispheres uh, acting as the top geometry, applying a defined downwards load. And we're sliding those, um, that, that geometry on top of appliant surface uh, using the cosmetic product as a lubricant, and we're measuring the coefficient of friction. 
And this is really interesting if you're looking to uh, find out uh, kind of the impact, or if you're looking to uh, benchmark and compare uh, different raw materials. So in this particular example that I've got in the uh, bottom right hand corner, we looked at comparing silicone lubricants to a liquid lubricant to a gel lubricant. And we can see some really uh, distinct and interesting looking profiles here. And what we do then, we take this information, these tribological fingerprints, and that will then ultimately feed into the models that we generate, the multidimensional models uh, for sensorial analysis and prediction and, and a bunch of things. And talking about modeling here, um, so what we've got on the screen now is a really good example of a way that we use some of this, we bring some of this information together. This is a very basic, simple example, but yeah, we, we've talked about structure, so there yield stress is a great measure of structure. We've talked about viscosity, particularly at high shear when you're spreading onto the skin. Uh, so there we, uh, we can incorporate that in our model. And then we've also talked about coefficient of friction uh, uh, in the tribology testing. And that we can bring those together then and use that for creating these rheological, tribo-rheological spaces there within which we can place our benchmark products, anything we've identified in the marketplace is a really nice texture. Uh, our uh, competitor products or something and uh, um, and new formulations versus old formulations and you can start to get a visual feel then of how close you're getting to a certain benchmark and what is the impact of let's say adding a, a, a certain surfactant a certain polymer a certain emollient in into your formulation there and then we can take this further really um, so there we talk about three-dimensional data here, what we did with these, we, here we've got some fearsomely complex behaviors. We've got a bunch of um, wax blends here, complex wax blends. These are actually depilatory uh, waxes here. And these things that you heat them up, you slather them on your leg, and then you pull your hairs out of your legs. And, uh, and the handling properties have to be just right over a long period of time and over a long range, of, a wide range of temperatures. And so there's a lot of nuance in this data here. So what we did on the left hand side, you can see the modulus as a function of temperature. On the right hand side, we can see the elasticity, the elastic response as a function of temperature. And uh, with it, well, how are we going to deal with this? Well, what we can do is we could use some uh, uh, AI techniques, machine learning algorithms, and we could use some really cool statistics techniques like principal components analysis. And we, we uh, throw our data into that. Uh, we get some clustering from the machine learning. And, uh, and then we also use the PCA techniques as a, um, a cross validation there. And then what we've done there is we've colored, each of the plots is colored. Uh, you can see which of the plots goes into which of the clusters that our machine learning algorithm has kicked out. And then we use the PCA as a cross validation for that. And you can see there then that we've got more or less you know, close uh, similarity in the red products and the red cluster. And you can see those red uh, plots in the, um, in the formulations themselves. And this then allows us to exploit some of the really cool techniques that rheology and tropology and some of the other stuff can, can deliver us, um, but also to put an accessible front end on this data, get some value for it. So we're not just got piles of data on our plate, really. Uh, get some value, get some uh, visual assessment of what's going on. And then we can use that for marketing, for ingredient selection, uh, or just to impress your boss, really. <laughs> I think that's a that's a key takeaway, isn't it? <laughs> Impress the boss. <laughs> um, so we we've covered um, uh, a whole bunch of different areas within rheology and how uh, we certainly use it um, for various applications within cosmetics. But um, if you guys have any interests, uh, or if you indeed have any questions, well, we're here to, uh, I guess, take them and answer them now. Um, uh, Perry. All right. Thanks, guys. You guys can hear me yes, okay? Yes, yeah, you're coming through clearly. All right. Well, thank you so much for that uh, excellent uh, presentation. And I'm so glad we got the uh, the animations yeah. going, so the video, we could see that. Because this presentation, I think more than any that we've seen, really need you need really need to see those examples. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a number of questions. Uh, if you want to just unshare your screen, we can go back to the three panels here. There we go. All right. Uh, so why don't we just get to, uh, if you had some questions you want to get answered, we still have a little bit of time, but uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, our first question comes from Rita. She says, how long does stability and claim support testing take? 
Okay, well. okay. So, so what we're doing here is, um, uh, no, let's look at stability. I mean, actually, I'm not sure whether she means what's the turnaround time. <laughs> so, the turnaround right. time on sample testing is really quick. <laughs> you can, yeah, if you send us some samples and, and we'll have a chat with you about what you want from it, then we can get the results back to you within two or three days, typically, really. So, um, uh, Although yeah. I, I, I would say, like on a stability test, uh, while the the measuring doesn't take much time, the tot test take, takes a long time. Like uh, we do stability yeah. testings where we take samples two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, three months, six months, and then 12 months. So yeah, the, the, the sample testing doesn't take long at all, but yeah. that could take a while. Yeah, uh, but how about, how about yeah. on the claims testing? Yeah. Okay. Then. So, um, and just a, just a quick word about the stability. So, what we're doing here is we're generating data. We're, we're measuring the physical properties, some of the physical properties that contribute to stability. And it's important to to not overstate this, really, because it's um, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that can happen with a formulation that's outside of the world of rheology, really. So, um, uh, so we're measuring physical properties like zero shear viscosity, structure, thixotropic recovery that all contribute to a stable uh, formulation, really. Um, okay, uh, claim support. So again, with claim support, there you're typically looking at, well, what, what is the claim you're looking to? Are you looking for something that's going to be a smooth feel, uh, less greasy, uh, less oily, something like that, really? And then you, typically you can measure oils and greases and you can quantify the similarity of a certain product to that or you can quantify the increasing distance uh, in this multi-dimensional space of your new formulation uh, from that benchmark there and um, uh, and then you start to get the basis of some of some claims support data there really but it's it's this huge amount of different claims um, we need to talk through and uh, and find out what you're looking yeah. to do there get hold of the products put shape the real logical tree on them and uh, and see what we get Right. So, so mostly it depends. <laughs> it depends on the claim. <laughs> All right. I hate, uh, I hate to say that, Perry. <laughs> Brazil says, uh, "Is tackiness another way to describe stringiness?" So, what's the what's the relationship yeah. between tackiness and stringiness? Yeah, stringiness and tackiness is a really interesting area, and a lot of it is down to semantics, really. But um, uh, tack, we can think about adhesive qualities, really. Can we can think about um, um, uh, work of adhesion and uh, and the characteristics around that really. So some products are likely to be stringy, um, but they're not necessarily going to be great adhesives really. So um, tack in particular is a really interesting one because tack is highly dependent on temperature. Well, I'll tell you, we, we get a lot of interest, for example, in testing for um, uh, the tackiness of uh, hand sanitizer gels at the moment. Sure. And, uh, and and there we're typically we're looking at things like adhesion, but we're conditioning over certain temperatures, drying the product off. We're looking at a uh, a plot of of tack as a function of time, and then the area under that plot is a measure of overall unpleasantness. Really, so um, yeah, so so there's there's a bunch of things there, but um, it's not directly stringiness, and uh, and what we're talking about here are interfacial characteristics, rheological properties. Uh, uh, the, you know, the interaction with the product with the topology of the skin. There's a whole bunch of different things, but some really juicy stuff to get into there. Yeah. Uh, Samar says, uh, can you measure the rheology of any kind of formulation? Is there something you guys can't measure? <laughs> that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> sounds like a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> if they're prepared to pay, we're prepared to give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> we, we've measured a huge amount, really. Uh, oh yeah, we, over the you know the, the several years we've been here now, we've measured thousands and thousands of different material types, just outside mm. of cosmetics. Yeah, you know, we, we've measured anything from slurries and and uh loads of cheese food the concrete cheese. um yeah we we've measured um tooth floss we've measured toothpastes uh we've measured chicken viscera i mean like it's any anything where the physical properties of how that uh, that product is behaving is important um we've been asked to measure it in some small uh, some small form of, or another or indeed identifying relevant methods that will quantify uh the uh well how that behaves in 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 performance i guess uh, well uh, someone did follow up with uh, uh can you measure powder products 
Yeah, so powders is really interesting. And, uh, and we're doing a lot of work with powders now, more and more, actually. Uh, so we've got a couple of instruments in the lab here. Uh, so we've got a, um, a, a rather aging Brookfield PFT powder flow tester. It's a shear cell. And, uh, and we've just taken delivery of a new Freeman FT4, uh, which is a shear cell and also some of the dynamic testing capability and uh, permeability and bulk capabilities as well there, really. And it's really interesting. There's a ton of stuff you could do with that. We're still exploring all of these capabilities there. Um, with powders, you're typically interested in cohesion. You're interested in internal friction of the powder, a wall friction, how the powder behaves up against a certain surface, um, caking. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a load of different stuff there. But it's a, it's a, it's a whole new ball game. but it's some, some uh, really interesting... Um, uh, learnings that we could take from from liquid rheology and semi-solid rheology and apply those to powders. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot less developed in the study of powders than in the study of liquids, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. an emerging area. Yeah. Uh, Rajat says, does the pH have any effect on the viscosity of a product? Uh, well, big time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Yes>. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, Perry, you've probably got far more experience of that than we have. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, if uh, one of the cool things you can do is to do a temperature analysis uh, of uh, viscosity over temperature, you could do an analysis of viscosity over pH range. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Uh, Natalia says, uh, can you use rheology for a sensorial analysis? Yeah, that, that's really a big part of what we do here, really. So say sensory analysis, what we're doing there is we're looking at the physical properties that contribute to the sensory, and we're measuring the similarity or quantifying the similarity of uh, though a given formulation to a benchmark of known sensory properties. So we're not doing a direct prediction, uh, not so far as a direct prediction, uh, but what we're doing is we're measuring how close a new formulation is to a benchmark that our customers apply, uh, supplied that's uh, a, of known sensoriality. Our customers then take that information and they can use that then for building up a, a, a rapid prediction that helps them um, get around, particularly some of the current issues with sensory panels there, really. Uh, yeah. And so you can sort of rapid screening of a large number of formulations there, get together a short list, and then that short list then goes through to the sensory panels. So we're never gonna replace a sensory panel, yeah. but, but um, it's a useful tool nonetheless. Well, it's interesting. Isabel asked specifically there, what measurements uh, do you recommend to at least partially replace that human sensory panel? Yeah, so so uh, there's kind of things we've been talking about. So viscosity, well, if you think about it, you take a cream, you take the lid off the cream, uh, you've got a tub of product there, really. So the low shear viscosity, yield stress modulus, all determine the initial touch and the pickup. So to apply it, then you're getting into viscosity there, and we're starting off a relatively low shear viscosity. As that layer gets thinner and thinner, we're getting into a higher shear viscosity. But then as that layer gets really thin, we start to get direct interaction between the surfaces. And then we're moving from the world of rheology into the world of tribology. Then we can do those tribological fingerprints that we were talking about there, build up these, these um, multidimensional models, throw it into the machine learning clustering algorithms and PCA uh, alongside our benchmarks that, that the customers provided, or we've got a bunch of benchmarks that we use here as well, and, uh, and start to build up a map, a visual map then. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's something we've done many a time and it's great fun and it's really interesting. And, and we we've had some pretty good results from it. Yeah. Again, it's another kind of emerging uh, area of research, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is uh, what makes this uh, actually kind of kind of cool because, uh, you know, we're still learning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Here's a question that comes from Mathis. He says, hi, Neil, I am using an Anton Parr MCR302. Uh, I guess that means something, uh, a, a device. Would I be able to accurately measure uh, at a 10 to three or 10 to four shear rates? Okay, so yeah, so the MCR302 is a great instrument, really good, there's a lot you can do with it. Um, I, uh, it, a lot of the, the, if you're looking at the low shear capability, I'm pretty confident the instrument can get down to those shear rates. There's no problem at all. You need to make sure you're down there and you're not getting slip. So the first thing you need to do is start thinking about if you're measuring a multi-phase material, like an emulsion or a suspension, then you've really got to be careful that you've, you're using some cross-hatched or serrated or sandblasted surfaces, really, to grip that sample. And then just make sure you've got the right 
uh, the right settings so that each data point, ideally you're achieving a, an equilibrium condition before you gather those data points. But let us know and um, yeah, we can talk through and we'll give you some tips, no problem at all. All right, looks like we have time for just a few more questions. I'm sorry if we don't get to all of the questions, but uh, we appreciate all of the time that we've had so far. Uh, here's one from Carly. Does alcohol denatured in sunscreen help with the spreadability and greasiness? And does it evaporate off the skin or stay on the skin? I, well, I'm I, gonna I, say the uh, alcohol is gonna evaporate. Know. Yeah, no, the alcohol yeah. is gonna evaporate off yeah. the skin. But as far as it, uh, alcohol, what's your experience with alcohol affecting the spreadability or greasiness of, of products? Do uh, you have any, any uh, experience there? No, I mean, if we're talking about, you know, for example, um, uh, hand sanitizers, then, then you've got a massive change in a very short space of time there, really. So you need to then take some techniques to try and capture uh, those those characteristics there. It's difficult. Uh, it, you do end up with, I mean, it's straightforward, but there's a lot of work involved, really, because yeah. you've got to, um, yeah, capture the product at those individual time points throughout the consumer's experience. Yeah, uh, we're just gonna do two more questions here. Uh, VJ says, do you recommend any software for AI and ML? I mean, does... um, have a chat with us. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually in the, in, the chat, in the chat, I had shared your emails. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and after yeah. the webinar here, uh, we're going to send you an email about replay. So everybody who attended will get a replay notice. That'll have contact information for you guys. And so we're going to end up with this final question it comes from Izamar. If I'm trying to compare two formulas, what would be considered a significant difference between them in terms of rheology? We hate that question. We absolutely, <laughs> we, that's the worst question you could close this out on, Perry. <laughs> it, it depends. <laughs> there, yeah. you made me say it. <laughs> the answer is it depends. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You need to. You need. Ultimately, you need to know your your the theater you're working in. You need to know the landscape you're working in, really. Once you know that, if you work, you know, then you can start to identify, you know, the, you put some perspective on the two products you're trying to compare. Yeah, and I will just add from a formulator standpoint, um, you can show a lot of differences in a laboratory using really precise measurements uh, that don't make one bit of difference to consumers because they can't tell. <laughs> so uh, I remember looking at uh, shampoos where viscosity was, say, 5,000 and another viscosity of a different sample was, say, 8,000. But a consumer couldn't tell the difference there, even though the instrument could. So I think it really is going to depend on your system, the sensitivity of your measurements. And finally, most important, what can your consumers notice? So Yeah. Statistical significance is way different from practical significance. <laughs> right. It's great for claims, but maybe not for formulating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for this time. Thank you, everybody, for attending the IFSCC webinar. Our next webinar will take place in two weeks. It's going to be just a question and answer of formulations with uh, formulations experts. I'm going to give you two the last final word. So, uh, Joey, Neil, you got anything else to add? Joey, you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I am just hope that everybody learned something interesting from here. If you do have um, any specific interest, we've got loads of content on our website, our YouTube channel, and I'm always looking for new ideas on different topics to cover uh, that we make available um, either as a video or as an article on our website. So actually, Joey, uh, I, I, I don't think you mentioned the YouTube channel. So, I mean, you mentioned you had one. What, oh. How do people find that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, youtube.com forward slash Rheology Lab. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got a bunch yeah. of different videos on there. We've uh, we've got one on zero shear viscosity, one on uh, yield stress, one on uh, talking through complex modulus. If you'd like the the whole unscientific sponge, uh, honey soaked sponge idea. Yeah. There's there's tons that we're always trying to bring out. But also, again, uh, I'm up for ideas. If you want to see it, let me know, and I'll be on there soon. <laughs> and the other thing okay. is, if you want to talk, to, if you want to talk to a human, just give us a call. Just drop us an email. We can set up a uh, set up a meeting, and uh, we'll just talk through talk you through stuff. Show you around the lab. We're doing loads of live lab tours at the moment. Mm. Uh, we've got some really cool new gear in the lab as well. We want to show. So um, yeah, just just chat with us and uh, yeah, yeah. nerd out with us yeah exactly all right yeah. thanks a lot guys and thank you for a fascinating uh webinar and i will see you on the web thanks so much right. take care Bye, everyone thanks very
And we are live. Hello, everyone. Hey, hello. Well, welcome. Hey we uh, This is the IFSCC webinar series. Uh, Mary Lynn, this is which one? Number, this is number 10? I think so. Wow. Hard to look believe. At us, look at us go. 10 webinars. We started these back in April and mm -hmm. we haven't missed, uh, a, well, we do every other week. So we haven't missed one since April. And coincidentally, I haven't got my hair cut since then either. So. <laughs> I've tamed it down to cosmetics, so it's not crazy. We've got uh, already 18 people online. Hello, everybody who's online. Welcome to the IFSCC webinar series. Uh, what we always like to do before we get started, uh, we just sign on early just to make sure all the technology is working. We've got people from all over the world. Uh, Mary Lynn, uh, you're located in? Long Island, New York at my sister's house. There you go. Joey, you're located in? So I'm in Warnford in the UK, in the south of the UK. And uh, Neil, you are? Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just across the office from Joey, across actually. We're in, so we're in Hampshire, <laughs> yeah. in the south of England. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome. I am in Chicago. If you're just signing on right now, why don't you let us know where you're from? Say hello. Uh, you can do that in the chat there. Uh, we like to find out who is the farthest away from where we are, right? But Mary Lynn, we've had people from what, uh, Hong Kong. That's pretty far. New Zealand. We had one person from Iran, which had oh. to be like in the middle of the night. That's right. I think more time zone. How? Who's the most inconvenienced by the hour we choose? <laughs> oh, there is that too. That's right. We, we were trying to set up a webinar coming up, uh, and I think that's our next one coming up, uh, the question and answer session. Yes. Uh, yeah, that'll be fun. We were trying to set it up with somebody from each part of the globe. Unfortunately, the, the people in Australia are uh, a lot later than we could do. One, it's one in the morning in Australia now. All right. We got our first people checking in. We got Sabine from Switzerland. Hello, Sabine. We got Eric from Mexico. Welcome, welcome. This is the IFSCC webinar. Um, today's webinar is going to be about viscosity, so that'll be fun. Um, guys, since we have you on the line and we got a little time, uh, why don't you let us know, uh, Joey, how did you get involved with rheology? Oh, that's a great question. So um, about three and a half years ago, um, well, I, I, I used to work for Apple in the be uh, business development department. So I was actually selling uh, computers at the enterprise level, um, but I was looking for a little bit of a change. My background's actually uh, in biomedical sciences. So I was looking for s something in scientific sales. Ah. Um, something popped up um, and I went in for an interview with Neil. And uh, yeah, he got me started off um, uh, kind of uh, selling our services to the cosmetics and food sector. And the rest is kind of history. My role's very much mutated now, um, yeah. where I'm looking more into the marketing side of things. So scientific communication is a big part of what I'm doing here these days. But that's that's kind of my journey from, well, science to sales to sure. working with rheology and Neil. <laughs> well, that's what happens, you know, if you're a scientist and you want to make money, go into sales. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, no, I, we, we love the salespeople. And uh, Neil, hello, welcome, Neil. How did you get involved with Viscosity? Hey, Perry. Um, so I, I first got into rheology. Uh, I worked at TA Instruments for a few years, at, uh, way back in the 1990s, actually, um, sort of mid-90s. And from TA, I went to a company called Rheometric Scientific, who were around at the time. Uh, they've since been subsumed into TA, actually. And then in uh, 1998, decided I'd prefer to be using the equipment, really, rather than selling it. So um, I set myself up and um, uh, basically hit the road and started running practical training courses in, in rheology. And, uh, and yeah, really for the last um, 23 or so years, I've been doing that, sort of buzzing around all over the world, really helping companies um, uh, understand rheology, understand viscosity and viscoelasticity and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then do the practical stuff, really. There's some fantastic literature out there, but, um, but I really get involved with the practical stuff. So running the instruments, looking at test methods, results, interpretation, and that kind of thing. So that's it. And then I, I um, started the Center for Reindustrial Rheology here in 2012. Uh, team of nine of us now, really, and we do a whole bunch of interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fascinating topic. And for cosmetic chemists, uh, the thickness of a uh, of a product and uh, how to thicken stuff, how to affect the way it feels in people's hands. 
is a really important aspect that probably doesn't get as much attention as it deserves uh, from formulators. You know, mostly you just mix stuff together and how it, the thickness that it ends up, it ends up that way. I recall we had a, there was a conditioner I worked on and you had to let it sit up in the uh, in the, the three thousand gallon tank for uh, at least six hours for it to set up to the right viscosity, which made it very difficult uh, for mass production. Yeah, and that, that I mean that's a major challenge as well, actually, because somebody you know somebody wants to release a you know a company want to release a batch and get the product filled and get it out of the door. Uh, they need to know really where it's going to be in twenty four hours, thirty six hours time. And there's Absolutely. so much that can happen over that time. Your wax is solidifying, polymers hydrating, all that. And uh, yeah, so um, it's, uh, that, that, um, uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, uh, we are just about just over five minutes away. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, feel free to say hello. We've got uh, Mercedes from Barcelona, uh, Stefan from south of France. Stefan. Stefan, have you been there, uh, Mary Lynn? Uh, ah, bien sûr, à Nîmes, c'est joli. Yeah. It's very ah. pretty. Oui. Uh, let's see. Place. Bahar from Indonesia. Now that one's, it's probably pretty late in Indonesia, right? right. Yes. What is it? Must be midnight there? I'll, <laughs> I'll calculate in a minute, but I wanted to show you, I think, can you see on my phone? I see That's your phone. where the Rheology guys are from. Oh, there you go, yeah. Sorry, I've right. got a, a not very we'll, clear connection today. So we'll wave out the close, window. Maybe you can see us. Yeah. You're very close to the very close to the channel, at least on there. <laughs> absolutely, got, absolutely. Back in the times when we could move around, we would use it regularly. Oh yeah, <laughs> remember those days? No, uh, oh, wistfully. <laughs> oh, we've got uh, Lucian, uh, Lucy, Lucian, Lucian from Canada. Uh, Tony from San Diego, welcome everybody. Uh, Maria from Mexico City, we've got uh, have all the, oh, Mumbai, India. Uh, hello, welcome. Have we got, uh, oh, Skari from Taiwan. Have we got all the continents? Uh, has anyone checked in from Africa? I haven't seen anyone from Africa yet. And no one from yes. Australia. There you got Hannes Vorster from South Africa and I actually oh. met Hannes uh, years ago. So oh, hi Hannes, you? yeah, <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> wow, wow. That, that's great. Well, welcome. We've got, uh, we're going to get started in five minutes uh, on the Rheology webinar. Now, uh, I had said, now I had mentioned thickness, and I'm sure you're going to cover this in uh, the talk. But when I said, oh, these guys are going to talk about thickness, you're like, oh, it's Rheology. <laughs> so do you, do you guys like, you're like, yeah, it, it's, Rheology is more than just thickness, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, I mean, um, you think about uh, all of the different situations that, uh, you know, you're, you want your cosmetics product uh, to behave, you know. Um, when it's sat under storage, you want it to have a high viscosity, but that's going to affect its sensorial properties or how it might be processed or how it might come out of a dispenser. Um, so you're really trying to, uh, what we're trying to do is to characterize all of these different behaviors uh, in such a way that it's easy to quantify the similarity or indeed the differences between them. Um, and sometimes viscosity doesn't go quite far enough in describing all of those different, uh, I guess, uh, physical behaviors in here. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know if, um, do you want me to, should I fire up the presentation and? Oh uh... uh, no, we got, uh, we still have four minutes. Uh, we are just, uh, we are just riffing right I'm now. Chomping on the bit. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? A topic that I always found interesting, mm. but uh, I, I remember when I was working on uh, it was a shampoo, but it was a, there was a body wash that I saw. It was it was thin like a body wash, but it had these gelatin beads just floating around there, and it was it was the most fascinating thing to me before mm. I knew more about rheology that you could have these things just kind of suspended in your product, but it would still be liquidy thin. And I always was fascinated to figure out like, how do you do that? And of course, uh, it's a property called suspension and you gotta use carbomers or xanthan gums, but uh, uh, that, that really uh, sends home the message that thickness does not equal holding things together, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right actually, Perry. And there's uh... Uh, I mean, we're going to get into this in a few minutes, actually. We'll start looking at the uh, the different behaviors when a product is at rest, when you want it to hold stuff, um, yeah. uh, when it's moving, when you want it to, to flow relatively freely, really. And that's where the complexity starts to come in. 
um, but it's uh, it's a kind of a delicious complexity, really. It's it's you know you're looking to to build a cocktail of characteristics into a product, and uh, and that's really where rheology rheology profiling really comes into its own. Really, being able to capture those different conditions there. Yeah. Now, uh, the exposure that I had to rheology mostly in my formulating career was the classic Brookfield viscometer, and actually, <laughs> when you do a stability test, you take the we had seven samples, at, so we had seven different conditions. Every couple of weeks, you had to go get the samples. First of all, trying to find the samples that you put out there you know, six months ago was always a challenge. But you'd find them, and then I would line them all up and then take the viscosity reading, take a pH reading, and I could get where I could do seven samples in 10 minutes. So it's a big competition for me to, to get through that because what you got to know, Mary Lynn, is that taking a viscosity measurement with a Brookfield viscometer, mm. you have to run the viscometer for one minute. That was at least our procedure. So, Now, you guys are using more sophisticated stuff than just the Brookfield viscometers, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. But but you can't ignore the uh, the viscometer as well. I mean, viscom those, those instruments are the, kind of the workhorse of the lab, really. So they're in you know, laboratories all around the world. So a lot of our customers are companies that are maybe currently using a, a Brookfield type viscometer, but mm -hmm. they, they identify there's a lot more information they need to know. There's a certain load of textual stuff and sure. handling properties and stuff, and uh, and the instrument doesn't it doesn't give you enough there really. So we kind of pick up from where that leaves off, and we and we'll talk about that in a moment. Actually, yeah. excellent.